let me first uh, uh, present our speaker today, Juan Diego Urbina. Juan Diego Urbina did his uh, Bachelor of Science and his Master in the National University of Colombia in Bogota. Um, his master's thesis was on quantum chaos. And then he moved to Germany to the MPI PKS in Dresden. And he did his PhD there that was finished in the group of Klaus Richter in semi-classical theory of wave functions in 2004. Then he spent some time as a postdoc with Smilansky in the Weizmann Institute in Israel, went back to Bogota as an assistant professor, and then back again to Regensburg. He, he has been there uh, since 2014, working on formulating semi-classical methods in many body systems. He is an assistant professor there in Regensburg University. So we are very, very happy to have him as our speaker today and it's all yours okay so thank you very much francisco and the locals for the as i was as we were mentioning to accept my self invitation to this uh, to these seminars i'm very very happy to be here and um, i have enjoyed very much the the past uh, sessions so uh, I hope that my talk hits the, the, the mark of the, of the very beautiful talks I have seen the last, the last moment. Okay, what I'm going to, to tell you about is yeah, the coexistence between scrambling and revivals uh, around um, excited state quantum phase transitions. And um, so this is a, a talk, is, is, it has two pieces. One piece is general, um, the general introduction, how to do semi-classical methods in uh, many bodies uh, focus space, let's say, and then a specific application on scrambling around SQPTs. And um, so this is work made by, mainly by two PhD students in our group, Benny and Quirin. Klaus is uh, the boss of the group of quantum complex systems, and uh, that's me. So, okay, let's go for it. Uh, I, I need to do a very, very, important disclaimer here. I will be talking about semi-classics all the time here. And uh, like uh, every different community has a different idea what is semi-classics. So I will define very precisely what I mean by semi-classics here. And it's semi-classics in the spirit of uh, Martin Gutzpiller, that uh, if you want to, to learn about this quantum chaos and semi-classics, that's the book in, in, in the book on the subject. It's an amazing read, I fully recommend. So what I mean by that is that semi-classical methods use properties of the classical solutions, the classical phase space, to describe quantum mechanical amplitudes. So you have to keep in mind that semi-classics in this talk is quantum mechanics. It's a way to do quantum mechanics with classical information. It's not classical mechanics at all. So I'm, I'm trying to use classical information to describe quantum mechanical amplitudes, not even probabilities, amplitudes. So very, very fundamental quantum objects. As such, they are fully respectful um, for the kinematics of quantum mechanics. So Hilbert spaces, superposition principle, entanglement, all that is perfectly well described within semi-classical methods, no problem. In particular, interference. And they, they are way more than the qu uh, classical quantum correspondence that is it breaks down after what is called the Ehrenfest or breaking time. We know that the classical wave packet follows, the, the, the quantum wave packet follows the classical evolution for certain time, and then you cannot do that anymore. This is called the breaking time. The semi-classics, as I use in this talk, is perfectly valid beyond this breaking time. One has to know how to do it, of course. And uh, the cool thing about semi-classics is that they provide a very unambiguous way to relate uh, classical properties like integrability of chaos with quantum, the, with quantum mechanical observables. So the quantum signatures of uh, integrality of chaos are explored using semi-classical methods in the sense I'm using here. In particular, they provide a very precise definition of quantum chaos. Um, the still semi-classical methods are approximations. So they are valid in certain regime. And this regime is the re what we call the semi-classical regime where a typical action of the system is large compared with H bar. 
And so some systems do not have a semi-classical regime, but most systems uh, are amenable to, to semi-classics because they allow for a regime where this happens. And uh, the key concept that I, I need to transmit to you is that there are uh, semi-classical methods are asymptotic in, the, in a very precise sense in H bar, meaning they are non-perturbative. There are other types of semi-classical approximations that I call more quasi-classical, like wigner moyal expansion, which are formally expansions in powers of H bar. But uh, semi-classical methods, as I understand here, are non-perturbative in H bar. I will give examples. So, as I mentioned, semi-classical methods live in certain regime in the semi-classical regime. So this is a famous picture by Zurek, shows the fuzzy quantum world and the sharp classical world. And we have this, this uh, boundary here, the quantum classical boundary. But semi-classical methods are supposed to, or are uh, designed to tell us what happens with the quantum world near the classical border. We can do this in several ways. We can, the, uh, let's start with the, as historically we did it, we have few particles, let's say one particle, and we consider the regime where the action of the system describing that describes this particle is large compared with H bar. Formally, we consider H bar going to zero, which in practice means things like a Fermi wavelength times size of the system going to infinity. In this regime, few particles, or let's say one particle, and moving for large actions, formally H bar going to zero, Gutzwiller constructed the semi-classical approximation for the quantum mechanical propagator, which is called the Gutzwiller van Vleck propagator. And this is the tool to do semi-classics in this regime. What is, where do you get the classical information you need to build this propagator? You get it from the classical limit. And the classical limit of particle systems well, are, are Hamiltonian systems of particles described by one, two, three, finite number of degrees of freedom. There is the, the very important uh, idea that when you approach the classical limit, h bar goes to zero, an infinitesimally more amount of the coherence will make you jump from quantum to classical. But still, if you don't have the coherence there, h bar going to zero is still quantum mechanical, coherent and everything. And this is the, 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 the kind of physics we want to describe. We don't have the coherence here, and we have h bar going to zero. And the classical limit for one particle then is Hamiltonian mechanics of one particle. Now, there is another super interesting regime, which is more particles in h bar going to zero. Again, in this regime, finite number of particles for h bar going to zero. The classical information you, you need to do semi classic, you take from a system of classical particles. Now, the, there is another way of thinking about classical limits, which is kind of perpendicular, which is I will fix h bar, h bar is some the numerical value of h bar as a constant of nature, but I consider the asymptotic limit not when h bar goes to zero, but when the number of particles goes to infinity. Then up there, when the number of particles is asymptotically taken to infinity, um, the quantum theory of this system, which is, uh, is well described by quantum field theory, transforms into a classical field theory with an infinitesimal amount of the coherence. So I can formulate the semi-classical program again in this direction when I take the classical information I need to construct quantum mechanical amplitudes from the classical limit, which is typically a nonlinear wave equation, like the gross pitaesque equation. Again, an infinitesimal amount of the coherence in this regime takes the system from quantum to classical, but now we are talking about quantum and classical fields or discrete fields like bose howard models, things like that. Well, the, this, this regime where this happens, this border between quantum and classical is what is called uh, mathematically um, a singular limit. Why is that? Because it turns out that if you are doing quantum mechanics at a certain action scale S, this is not the same as doing classical mechanics at a certain action scale S plus corrections in the small parameter, which is h bar over s. This, this idea that I can expand quantum, um, um, I can expand quantum mechanics as classical mechanics plus corrections in h bar as an expansion, as a power series, works in several situations. This is this Wigner-Moyal approach, for example, that is super useful, but not always. 
in the same way, in the other direction, large number of particles, quantum mechanics at certain number of particles large uh, is not the same as classical for corrections in close corrections in one over n, in one over the number of particles. Again, because this limit is singular, what are you missing here is interference. So interference is manifest in this in this um, in quantum mechanics through the appearance of non-analytic functions of the small parameter. For example, this. And the double slit experiment has objects that behave like actions divided h bar in an exponent. This is not something that you can expand in h bar going to zero. So you cannot get interference out of uh, this sort of approximation. In the same way, when you move in the direction of large number of particles, what you will be missing is many bad interference that manifest in the existence of such um, oscillatory functions with the number of particles uh, producing larger and larger, larger oscillations. This is what I mean by um, the physics of interference is non-perturbative in the semi-classical parameter, h bar or n. And uh, a good example of this non-perturbative character is discreteness. The discreteness of the quantum mechanical um, spectra is a consequence of in constructive interference. So it's non-perturbative. You don't get discreteness by perturbative methods. So, uh, I mean, you can study discreteness using perturbative methods if you do perturbation, quantum mechanical perturbation theory. But in the sense of starting with classical information, constructing quantum mechanical discreteness, this is a non-perturbative thing. Okay, so how do we do semi-classics? We, we start with, um, it's quantum mechanics. So the starting point is quantum mechanics. And um, the favorite way that Gutzbiller found to, to do semi-classics starts with the patented representation of quantum mechanics. So Feynman says when everything starts with defining an action functional that characterizes your theory, then you construct the patented, which is, the path integral, the sum over all possible paths, classical and no classical, joining initial and final configurations at certain time, weighted by an oscillatory function, which is the action function. And uh, well, this, this we call the Feynman path integral, this object, as we all know. And how can I use this object, which is an amplitude, the propagator is an amplitude, to calculate something I can measure directly, like a probability? Well, the probability to go from initial to final in certain time is the modulus square of the amplitude. So this is how you take the path integral and produce out of it the most basic quantum mechanical observable, which is what is the probability to go from here to there. So the question semi-classics and Gutzfeller asked is, uh, where are the classical paths here? This is an integral of all possible paths. Where are the classical paths? And whether the knowledge of the classical paths is in some sense useful to approximate the propagator or the probabilities. The answer is yes, we can use them. The classical paths are there. And the way it, uh, they appear is through the semi-classical approximation for the propagator that says that the Feynman propagator is given now by a sum. It's not an integral, it's a sum. It's a sum over what? It's a sum over classical trajectories, these gammas, weighted by the classical action, the classical, the Hamilton split simple function, which is the classical action functional evaluated at the classical path with some prefactors and some phases. The idea that this is like that was suggested by already by Pauli and was taken over by Van Bleck who produced the famous formula for this prefactor, which is called the Van Bleck determinant. And um, well, the problem is that Van Bleck forgot or didn't get in his, uh, in his uh, way, in his uh, way to derive the result. He didn't get the sum. So he was approximated the propagator by a single term, a single classical trajectory, and he didn't get this phase. These two problems were solved. And uh, because of that already was known at the time, this is an approximation valid only for short times for some technical reason. Now it took um, some 50 years um, to derive, to take the Feynman patent and derive a semi-classical approximation for the propagator in a way that you don't have the restriction to short times. The price you pay is that you have to put more trajectories and you have to put some phases there, which are called mass of indexes. This was done by Martin Gutierrez in the 70s. And I, I want to tell you now in a nutshell, very quick, very precisely, 
what do we mean by uh, how good Twitter took the final propagator and derived the semi-classical propagation. So you start with exact uh, path integral, expression for the amplitude. Then you apply brutally the saddle point approximation. Now, this we all know the stationary phase approximation from our lectures in analysis. We do it all the time, but we do it all the time with uh, finite dimensional integrals. To do this with a path integral in not uh, Euclidean, uh, Euclidean time, but in Minkowski time, meaning uh, to an oscillatory functional, this was quite uh, quite a step. And uh, so Gusbira just went and did it. So the stationary phase approximation says, okay, you have this integral, let's consider it as, a, as an integral, normal, no functional, normal. And uh, the first thing is that you need to find the places where the exponent uh, has, a, has a critical point, minimal or maximum. And uh, this translated in the language of, uh, functional, uh, um, of functionals, this means the variation of the action has to be zero. This means Hamilton's principle. And this is how you get classical mechanics to play a role here, because this equation defines the classical trajectories. This was done by Feynman, of course. This is how Feynman derived classical mechanics from his path integral was doing, uh, looking for the points of the stationary, the stationary points of the classical action. So this is very nice. Now you, we have to remember that this object, the propagator is supplemented by boundary conditions. So you, it goes from certain initial to certain final position. And the, because you have boundary conditions instead of an initial value problem, this classical problem admits several solutions. That is super important. Please remember that I have several solutions of the classical problem associated with the semi-classical analysis of the propagator. So I will label them by this gamma. There are different functions of the time that depend on the parameters of the propagator, which are initial final positions, initial and final times. What is left is uh, pretty standard. We expand the action around each of these classical solutions integrate the Gaussian quantum fluctuations. This is an approximation because the fluctuations in general are not Gaussian, but we stop at second order and that's why this is an approximation. And you suffer a lot regularizing the determinants that you get out of this monster and all that, and you get the Van Blake Putz field propagator. Okay, so this is the meaning of, of this formula. Mm. Okay, this was my intro to semi-classics. Please keep this kind of object in, 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 in mind. The objects in semi-classics are written as sums over classical solutions of a boundary problem. Well, now let's go to the to what we are all happy, that happy to be here is we are talking in this series of seminars about uh, criticality quantum phase transitions and excited state quantum phase transitions. So I don't need to introduce these. I mean, we, we, we are no, familiar in several branches of physics with the concept of criticality in the thermodynamic sense, like a critical point here between phases, quantum criticality, which is the, the, the manifestation. Um, we refer to uh, the finite temporal manifestations of something that happens at zero temperature. And this something that happens at zero temperature, we refer to quantum critical point. Uh, they are marked by typically some singular behavior of observables or some singular behavior of the separation of the energies, like in this case, where the gap between energy levels shrinks to zero a certain way, or simply to a crossing or a, um, avoided crossing in energy space as a function of a parameter. These are all related concepts with uh, criticality. What we want today, and the question we want to address is whether uh, criticality has something to do with the scrambling. So what is the scrambling? The, the kind of brutal notion of scrambling is, is very intuitive. I have a system. Let, let's take the system to be chaotic to start with. So this system is chaotic. It's a chaotic billiard. I throw in a wave packet there. So at the very beginning, I'm throwing this wave packet in this direction. So at the very beginning, this guy goes, hits the wall, and kind of comes back. And you still see signatures of the classical motion there. But eventually, at some point, let's say around here, the wave packet has spread so widely in the whole accessible space that makes no sense to think about this as representing the motion of one particle anymore. So this gives the idea that at some point, the 
the, the information contained on the initial state because of the chaotic dynamics spreads around in a way that is very hard to recover. Of course, we can recover it because quantum evolution is unitary. But in the semi-classical limit, there is a non-trivial interplay between unitarity and h bar going to zero. And this makes the concept of the scrambling in the semi-classical regime particularly important one. So, so just the information spreads around. And then you can, we will talk how to, what is the meaning of this in many body systems in a moment. The, the way to quantify uh, scrambling, there are several ways. One that uh, became super important the last uh, 10 years or so was proposed already in the 60s by, by Larkin and Oshiriko in the context of superconductivity. They introduced this object that we call the out of time order correlator, which is, well, it's a correlator, but it's special because it's not the standard expectation value of a commutator, it's an expectation value of a commutator squared. And because of that, you have a special non standard time order objects appearing here and therefore the name out of time order correlators. This object was recovered in, uh, by Kitaev some, some, some years ago uh, in the specific context of a scrambling of information in many body systems. So how the information contained in a, in a region of a space gets distributed around uh, due to, to quantum mechanical correlations and how hard it is to to bring this information back if the system that you are looking at has something like chaotic dynamics. So Kitaev introduced this in the context of the kind of folklore, uh, folkloric, you know, very common idea that black holes are fast scramblers. So black holes really mess around with quantum information. And a way to characterize how hard this happens is, uh, is using these uh, out of time order correlators. Then in a paper uh, that is uh, now a classic in Maldacena, Schenker and Stanford, um, introduced a conjecture about um, a bond in the behavior of the out of time correlator uh, depending on the temperature. And it's called the Maldacena bound. And it's an important, since then became a very important standard tool in many, um, many fields of physics. And, Right now, it should be order of thousands of papers talking about uh, autox in condensed matter and um, quantum gravity, chaos, many, many. Okay, just to pick up a, a particularly nice example of, of the relation between chaos and out of time order correlator is this um, paper by Galitsky and Wilson, where they calculate numerically this object for the Kicker rotor. The Kicker rotor is a, is a very standard chaotic system. And the behavior of the time of, of the autoc is, um, is very specific. You first have an exponential increase up to certain time where you get a saturation of the, of the autoc. And this time when this happens is the breaking time, the Ehrenfest time marking the breaking of the classical quantum correspondence. So the autoc has two regimes. One regime where things grow exponentially and this you can more or less visualize uh, using a classical, quasi-classical picture, meaning the commutator is something at the Poisson bracket, the, the Poisson bracket between the position and the momentum, the position at time t and the momentum at time zero is the stability matrix, is the derivative of the position, uh, final position with respect to initial position, something like that. And in a chaotic system, this behaves exponentially with the Lyapunov of exponent upstairs. Since you have a square, you have a two here. So this is, kind of intuitively very um, kind of easy to grasp. The saturation, that's a different story. Saturation is an interference phenomena. You need interference, you need semi-classical methods to describe that. So if we want to study the interplay between criticality and scrambling, well, one thing that we should, we better do is to go to systems where we can have criticality. And our favorite systems to observe criticality are many body systems. So one prerequisite to, to, to study and uh, uh, using semi-classical methods or the semi-classical thinking or in the semi-classical regime, the interplay between criticality and scrambling is to do semi-classics in many body space. And uh, well, this is a long shot, okay? When I say many body Hilbert space or focus space, of course, eventually I'm dreaming to do quantum chromodynamics or whatever, 
Well, we will take it easy. We will take a very simple um, many body systems to start with. And uh, many, they are simple in the sense of semi-classics, in the sense that they have a very, very well-defined classical limit, meaning mean field limit and, and other, other, other technical things that we need. So we will work mainly with the bosonic systems and um, uh, in particular with the bose hogar model. So as you all know, the bose hogar model you can visualize, you don't have to, but a possible way of visualize is that you have single particle orbitals and you put particles in these single particle orbitals. And since they are bosons, you don't care what do you put where, you only care how many do you put where. So the focus state associated with a configuration like that will be two particles in the first orbital, four in the second, three in the third, so on. These uh, states form a basis of, a fo of, of the many body Hilbert space, which is called the focus space. And in this space, you can define dynamics through um, the, that are given by the time evolution operator in terms of the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is built of um, creation and annihilation operators that move particles around. This will be the role of this term, what we call the hopping term, just move particles around, and they interact with each other. And this is done typically, uh, two particles only interact if they are in the same site. And that's why this thing is, uh, ha does, uh, has only one index. So this is the interaction part. This is the hopping part. This is what we call the on-site energy. Now you have your space, you have your Hamiltonian, you can study amplitudes there. So how do we think about semi uh, amplitudes in this space? Well, it's, uh, uh, we all know, the, the question I will pose is the following. I know that at the initial time, the state is described by a set of occupations, these ones. And I want to ask the following question. What is the probability that at a later time, the distribution of occupations is given by this other set of numbers? So the postulates of quantum mechanics tells you the answer directly. You know that quantum states evolve with the time evolution operator. You know that the transition probability between initial and final states are given by this matrix element. And uh, the, the transition probability is just the modulus square. This is just postulate of quantum mechanics. And so, but we can formulate again the same program. Uh, can we introduce a semi classical propagator to describe the quantum mechanical amplitude? A transition amplitude in focus space now? The answer is yes, we can do that. This is in a series of papers uh, some years ago, we, we, we posed this, this question. And pretty much as when you take h bar going to zero in the Stroenger equation, which is a wave equation, the classical information that you need to study this regime uh, you obtain from classical trajectories. When n goes to infinity, when the number of particles goes to infinity, the classical information that you need to do to construct your quantum mechanical amplitudes and propagators, as you obtain from a classical field equation now. And um, so this is Thomas Engel, the guy who, who went into constructing this uh, many body propagate, this semi-classical approximation for the propagator in focus space. Guess what? It looks very much like the Van Blake Kutzbiller propagator. So you do have a sum over solutions. Let me call it trajectories, but these are not trajectories or, 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 or of anything. I don't have particles here. This is, this is something else. They are solutions of a classical problem. I can associate actions to these solutions and some stability or some, some prefactors. And I can show that in certain limit, when, in, when the number of particles goes to infinity, the quantum mechanical propagator is well approximated by this sum over these solutions. Uh, you get it by such manifest approximation as usual. And what, I, what do I mean by trajectories here? Trajectories are actually um, the time dependent of some complex fields. These complex fields have a modulus and a phase. And the kind of classical problem you have to solve to do semi-classics in this space is really, really ugly. So I give you an initial set of occupations and a final set of occupations. With this, you define an initial set of the modulo, moduli of these fields, fix it by this set of occupations plus one half, that's not so important. 
And I do have a classical limit here, which is this, um, this um, nonlinear wave equation, for example, the gross pitaevsky equation or the discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation. That's your classical dynamics. And it admits several solutions depending on the initial phases you put. So the problem you have to formulate is, I give you initial occupations, final occupations, get me the phases I have to plug into the initial and final fields such that they satisfy the classical equations of motion, which are these nonlinear field equations. So this is a very hard problem uh, out of the question. Hmm? And, uh, but it's perfectly mathematically defined because this system is Hamiltonian. So we can think about every, all the nice things that we do and love when we do Hamiltonian mechanics, we can do here. Maybe with a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, okay, but this is a Hamiltonian system. Now it's not a system of particles. This is, this is, this is describing something different. It's describing occupations and phases in focus space, it's a different thing. Okay, I forgot to say that if anyone has any question or comment, be my guest. I will be happy to be interrupted anytime. Now, just as a, as, a, as a little tip, we can do it with fermions. And with fermions, things look very similar, but the equation, it's uh, quite, quite, quite ugly. But we can do this with fermions. I just want to, to mention that. Okay. Um, Juan Diego. Please. Yes, but this is very similar what you do usually with coherent states, for example. No, 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 no. No, because when you do coherent states, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to address this question. When you in a, in field when you do field theory, the, you open a book on field theory in, and you want to see how the propagator looks like. Most likely, what you will find is the propagator in co between coherent states. So we were very happy when we started this project because we thought, okay, that's it. They are giving us the path integral. We just need to do our stationary phase there. Well, the thing is when you do coherent states, you don't have, you don't specify initial and final occupations. In this language I'm using here, you specify initial and final occupations and phases. Now, if you think about this, the, the corresponding classical problem that you have to solve, you overdetermined brutally the classical problem. Is in terms of particles, if you let me come back to particles, if you work in coherent states, um, the standard Van Blake Buspiller propagator I show is addressing the following uh, physical question. I go from certain initial position to certain final position. And you need to find the momenta such that your trajectories go from initial to final. This problem admits several solutions. You have several values of the momenta, discrete or several. Each of them defines a different classical solution. Now, if you do coherent states, you put an initial QP, position and momentum, and a final QP. So classically, the problem is brutally overdetermined, meaning you start because the, the solution of the classical equations of motion for an initial value problem is unique. You specify initial position and momenta, you have a unique trajectory going somewhere. But you want the transition amplitude from this coherent state to this coherent state. So you, in principle, you need to find trajectories starting here and ending there in phase space, but you don't have because you have this, this initial condition fully determined the trajectory. So what people do is to complexify the classical dynamics to make the problem um, solvable again. But the price you pay is really high. You have to complexify the classical phase space. So every time you see a semi-classical analysis in coherent states, you have to remember these people are doing uh, complex, uh, complexifying the classical phase space. And that's, um, that's an honest, uh, completely different story, I would say. I hope that this more or less answers your question. Okay, thank you. Yes, it is complicated, but it helps. Please go okay. on. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back to it. Um, um, so let me use the chance to tell you, these are not coherent states. What I'm doing here is specifying initial and value uh, initial and final occupations. And okay, the, the equation is very nicely written in terms of complex fields, but just go into real and imaginary part, uh, and this will be positional momenta. And then you can see everything like something happening in coordinate representation. We can come back to it if someone has, has questions. Okay, 
Now, let me tell you how do we do interference in uh, many body focus space in uh, using semi classical thinking. Well, we, we, we know all that we need. We know that the amplitude is given by a sum over classical solutions. And I want to calculate the probability. So the probability is given by a double sum over classical solutions of these classical field equations. But what we do is, we, well, we have a double sum of oscillatory things. We look for constructive interference. I will give you one example of this way of thinking. Let's go and find coherent um, uh, constructive interference uh, to obtain something robust, something that doesn't disappear under a little bit of the coherence or averaging out of these double sums. So the most obvious thing is take the two trajectories, the two solutions to be the same. If the two solutions are the same, their actions are the same, and then this thing is not oscillatory. What do you get out of it? Well, this is what we call the diagonal approximation, where the two, so the two solutions I have in this double sum are taken to be the same. This is, of course, an approximation. The, the correct result has a double sum. I'm approximating this by, the, by taking only the diagonal. One can show formally that what you get out of this diagonal approximation is the classical solution. So this problem, this problem is perfectly well defined classically. I, I give you a bunch of trajectories with this position, starting at certain position in uh, arbitrary momentum. Tell me what is the probability, meaning tell me how many of those trajectories hit a final position and you don't care about the final momentum either. This is a perfectly well-posed classical problem that can be solved. And the solution is exactly what you get out of the diagonal approximation. So this is how the classical um, probability emerges. But something very cute happens if the initial and final configurations are the same. Because if the initial and final configurations are the same, you can kill the actions in two ways. You can do the two trajectories to be the same, and then you get the classical probability, and that's it. But you can also take one trajectory to be the um, time reverse of the other. I know that many people here are experts in mesoscopic physics, so you know what I'm doing. This is coherent backscattering of weak localization. But this I'm doing in focus space. It's not real space, it's not particles. I'm doing this with fields, no. What happens when you pair a trajectory with the, its time reverse is that you get an enhancement by a factor of two. This can be shown. So this way of thinking, I have classical traject um, I have amplitudes associated with classical trajectories that produce oscilla oscillations, and I want to look for something constructive there. This way of thinking produce a, a, a prediction here that is an enhancement of a factor of two in the probability of return. Because if I make the initial and final configuration the same, this is the probability to come back to the same configuration, what we call the probability of return of the survival probability in focus space. So you can check that numerically. We did it. This is a bose hover ring. And uh, I don't let me go into, I, I don't want to go into details, but the fact that you have everything here very flat, except for this point when you have an enhancement of two, is exactly the prediction that we, uh, what we obtain using semi-classic. This enhancement of two that can be seen in the numerical calculation. And just to, to, to advertise this a little bit, this is a bose hoar system with, uh, I don't know, 20 particles. So it's supposed that semi-classics is very, is very appropriate to use there because n, the number of particles is large. But we did it with, the very, with systems with, I don't know, seven particles, and you still see the enhancement there. So it, as usual with, with asymptotic techniques, semi-classical methods can be very robust. You can extend them way beyond what you, um, the, the regime where they are formally uh, defined to, to work. Okay, so this is how we think in terms of uh, many body solutions, many body classical solutions to build quantum mechanical interference. What about uh, the scrambling? How do, what, what does the semi-classical approach in many body focus space tell you about the scrambling? Then what uh, you go and do the calculation, which is substantially more difficult than coherent but scattering. What you get is indeed, you expect an exponential initial increase up to the RMFS time. The, the breaking time of the quantum classical correspondence between quantum fields and classical fields, or quantum bose hover systems, and the classical lattice classical systems. 
And uh, you can go and look for trajectories and specify which are the contributions that give you this exponential increase and this saturation. This we did some years ago. So we understand the semi-classics of scrambling, both the quasi-classical part or the classical part that you get out of classical arguments, the initial fast scrambling, and the saturation due to interference. We understand now in, in focus space in many body systems, um, chaotic, of course, this is for chaotic systems. Okay, so let me briefly tell you where we are. Um, if you look at the autocore in general, the, the, the concept of exponentially fast scrambling of information is a signature of chaos. Can be particle chaos, can be field chaos, but it's a signature of chaos. And the late saturation in chaotic systems is an interference effect. Both these concepts can be lifted from particles to bose hoar systems or field uh, systems or many body systems. There, what you have is that um, the, the, the notion of chaos there implies the instability of mean field solutions. So when you talk about scrambling in many body systems, the semi-classical understanding is that the fast scrambling is due to instability of mean field solutions, and the saturation is due to interference between amplitudes associated with different mean field solutions. Juan Diego, Please. excuse me, but Please. In, in, in any classical system, because the, the OTOC is very similar to the finite time Lyapunov exponent, or let, let's say to this, the spreading of the classical uh, a region where you started with many trajectories until if you have a finite phase space, it will saturate. So you don't need any interference to explain saturation. Any but yes, finite... but, uh, but this, I, I, uh, this is a super question. So I, I, I will be precise there. The, um, the classical limit of the autoc is, is given by the an element of the stability matrix. So I have a, a, a trajectory, and I look at uh, I look at the the mathematical Lyapunov exponent in the sense of I consider a neighbor trajectory, but I consider the limit when the initial separation is zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this mathematical definition of the stability matrix goes into the autoc, and the autoc is simply the square of this uh, element of the stability matrix. Now, but there, the, the, the precise definition of stability matrix in classical mechanics is that you take the limit where the initial separation goes to zero because it's a derivative, what you are doing there. Now, if you let this initial separation to be finite, then you will have the saturation phenomena that you mentioned. But if you make it to zero, you don't. The classical autoc keeps increasing forever because the, 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 the only thing that uh, the classical mechanic knows about this is that you have to put in there the derivative of final position with respect to initial position. And this derivative is exponential and it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all whether your system is finite or not at all. This gives you the exponential in period. Now, if you put a final difference, then the saturation will take place. And something you can do is to say, okay, Let's evaluate the, the, this, numer this um, derivative of final uh, position with respect to initial momentum or whatever. Let's evaluate it using a final difference. If you choose this final difference to be H bar, then the classical autoc is the same as the quantum autoc. But the important thing is that the classical, this is something that you are doing out of physical reasons. The definition of the, what you get as classical limit of the autoc has the exponential and doesn't saturate. And this, in the paper of Kalitsky, they do that super nice. They choose different values of the initial separation they use to numerically calculate the Lyapunov exponent. And you see that the, the saturation time is pushed to infinity when this distance is pushed to zero. So I hope that this, is, uh, this addresses your, uh, your question. Now, the quantum mechanical auto saturates due to interference, not because the, the the classical autoc saturates due to finite size. It's a different thing. I hope this is more or less okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, now I, I told you where, where we are respect to scrambling. 
Now, where we are with respect to um, exact state quantum phase transitions, where we have seen in the, the talks during the whole, um, this whole nice uh, series of seminars that uh, SQPTs are characteristic of quasi or integral regimes. For example, the favorite example is systems which are effectively described by one dimensional uh, classical Hamiltonian dynamics. And this is by definition, by construction integral. So we expect criticality to have an impact on scrambling. That's, that, that's true. And, uh, but we don't know how to make it together with the fact that the, in the um, semi-classical description of the autox, the scrambling is a signature of chaos. So what is the catch there? I know that many of you know what is the catch uh, here. It's local hyperbolicity, but uh, don't let me spoil the, the, the story right now. So do we have or don't we have a scrambling around the exact state quantum phase transition? The answer is that we do have. Huh? That's, that's, uh, and uh, for this now, we need to specify a model. Let's, uh, let's work with a model, identify an exact state quantum phase transition, and check for a scrambling there. So the model I'm going to use is, the, is a famous one. It's a Leibniz model. It's a continuous model of bosons in, in a ring. It's given by this Hamiltonian. And if you go to momentum, uh, if, if you define your focus space using the uh, eigenstates of the single particle momentum operator, meaning you go to momentum space, it looks like that. The sums are K and L and M and N. Now, label momen angular momentum eigenstates. So they can go uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity. They are just integers going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So these are infinite sums in accordance to the model being actually a model in the continuum. It's very, it's very important in cold atom physics. Leibniz is, is used uh, uh, quite a lot. It's an integrable model, that's good. From the, in the continuum case, it's full integrable in the sense of uh, um, um, inverse scattering method and all that, so it's, it's, this is well known. But we want to, this is kind of too much. So we want to reduce the dimensionality to, from infinity to very low to do our business because we know how to do semi-classic with bose hover systems, which are lattice modes. So one way to do that is, is uh, truncating momentum. I will consider momentum here only up to certain uh, uh, limit. Does this respect the physics of the problem? Yes, I mean, I'm showing you here the spectrum of the Leibniz model for 20 particles. This is the exact spectrum, exactly in the sense that I'm taking the maximum cutoff in momentum to be super large infinity. It's a very nice review where they study this, the, the effect of the truncation. And um, the, we are going to low, to put down the truncation in momentum to infinity to one. So are we, one, we are going to consider here a bosonic system with three single particle orbitals, momentum zero, momentum one, momentum minus one. Now you could say, oh, that's very brutal. You are killing the whole physics there. Well, no. I mean, the, 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 the physics that we want to capture that roughly speaking is about these energy levels bending here. This is your excited state quantum phase transition. We want to study that. So if this approximation um, still contains such physics, it's good for our purposes. So this uh, has been shown. I'm truncating here at minus two, minus one, zero, one, two momentum. And the, the bending is still there. And even if you go, go down to one, the bending is there. So the truncation of the Leibniz model to three modes respects, uh, captures the excited state quantum phase transition. And is integral. Any truncation of Leibniz to a finite number of the states beyond three is not integral. The continuum is integral, truncated is not integral, three modes is integral back. So we are going to do semi-classics uh, there. So I can, this is now a bose hover system with three sides. I can do my thing there. The machinery I'm going to use here is, uh, can be derived from the quantum mechanical propagator in focus space, do the whole thing. But it's more intuitive if you think about it as a kind of bohr sommerfeld quantization that I'm doing here. So the, the, uh, I'm doing here doesn't look rigorous, but can be made very rigorous. So we will associate a classical mechanics to the system by doing this Heisenberg change of going from creation and initial operators to complex fields with some modulus in a phase. This system has uh, three constants of motion, the energy, 
the angular momentum and the number of particles. That's why it's integral. And uh, you can uh, remove two of the constant of motion. I will fix the ang total angular momentum to be uh, zero, and I will fix the number of particles. So I effectively end up with a one-dimensional system with conserved energy, integrable again. This is not obvious, okay? To go from the three uh, side to the effective one degree of freedom, you have to do serious semi-classical, what is called torus quantization, which is, a, which is hard. It has some topological things that you have to consider, but okay, we did it. And what I'm going to show you is simply for angular momentum zero, the one dimensional Hamiltonian in terms of uh, my only left pair of canonical variables, set and phi. Set is a rescale occupation of the zero momentum state as you expect. Phi is the conjugated uh, classical um, uh, variable. Uh, this omega is the rescale energy in, uh, as energy per particle. And this alpha is the interaction is strength is scaled by the number of particles. And uh, I, I, we, we recognize this, this Hamiltonian. It's the Josephson Hamiltonian of a two-side uh, bosonic system, for example. With the typical behavior, some uh, cosine of the angle and some quadratic term in the occupation. This is, we have seen this in a million situations. And uh, during the process of quantization, then you get to identify the effective plan constant as the inverse number of particles as we expect. So the classical limit corresponds to this Hamiltonian, which is the Josephson Hamiltonian, which is a classical uh, Hamiltonian. And the small parameter, the parameter ruling the quantum classical transition is the inverse number of particles. Okay. Now, how does the phase space look like? We have seen this phase space again quite a few times because it's very generic of the story of excited state quantum phase transitions. This is the interaction strength. And I'm plotting here. This is the occupation and the angle. This is just the classical phase space. And these lines are lines or, um, or um, uh, equi energy lines. So these are the lines for which the, of constant energy in the, the contours of constant energy in the system. And the colors is just what is larger, what is small. So for very low interaction, this is what you get, quite boring. But if you start increasing the interaction, they start bending. Eventually, for certain value of the interaction, the kind of critical one, as what is called a separatrix appears, which is this line here. Let me make it more clear, increasing. So this is the typical behavior that, that uh, we associate with classical criticality. You have a subtle point around here, Around the saddle point, the motion is um, uh, this is um, it's rotational, and outside the separatrix, when you cross the separatrix, you go from this rotational motion to this librational motion. So there is a change in the topology of the classical solution when you cross a separatrix, and this is the classical signature of a quantum of an excited state quantum phase transition, because this can happen if you if you keep uh, playing with the parameters of the system, this, will, this change will happen to many different of these um, uh, energy contours, one after the other. So to show you that, um, to show you how to use that, this, this is something that we all know and love and we have seen these separatrices quite a lot. Now, I want to tell you how to actually quantize them. And this, uh, this has these tricky parts, as I mentioned. But the quantization condition, after taking into account all these topological aspects of the quantization of the original um, three degrees of freedom system down to one and all that, well, it's kind of bore uh, quantization as you were expecting. The action integral, which is something like the integral of um, the, um, dp times q, if you want, so d phi times n, remember that this is the occupation. You demand this uh, this integral, which is just the the phase um, is just the area um, defined by the energy you are looking at in phase space. You demand this thing to be quantized to, to be some uh, integer um, or semi-integer uh, times the effective plan constant. So you go and do this. Now this this is a, uh, this integral is not that nice. You have to perform it uh, approximately or numerically. But I'm showing you here two states, the state that corresponds to the quantized energy, uh, 0.01, just, it's just a number, 
and the one, sorry, and the one a little bit up. I'm defining the energy of the separatrix of this line to be zero. Okay. So you see the, the, the change of behavior when you change your state. Now, if you keep uh, doing that, you quantize the, 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 the whole, you get the whole spectrum. You have, for certain value of the parameters, you have one eigenstate, which is confined to be inside the separatrix and the others to be outside. But if you start changing parameters, more and more eigenstates that were outside start getting inside. And this is the exact quantum phase transition. I'm showing you here the dependence of the energy omega with the quantum number k. This quantum number I'm using to quantize the, the, uh, the, the motion around the, the separatrix. Okay, just to convince you that this works, this is comparison between semi-classics and, um, and uh, exact numerical uh, diagonalization of the, of the system for 20 particles, for 200 particles, for 1,000 particles. So you see this bending and this bunching of, of the states here, perfectly captured by the semi-classical approximation and uh, the standard signature of an exact state quantum phase transition. The, the fact that this is indeed uh, quantum phase transition, sorry, say, but quantum phase transition, you can look, um, you can take a look on the way the energy levels change as a function of the interaction parameter or the number of particles or both. Here I'm showing you that the energy levels, let's say one of these lines with a given color is how the energy level behaves parametrically with the scale interaction. And there you see there is a change of, 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 of behavior at some point, in this case happens here, happens here, happens there. And if you increase the number of particles, look at the scale. This is 1.5, this is 103. This, uh, this happens in a, in a region which is smaller and smaller. And of course, when n goes to infinity, this is sharp. But this is kind of precaution, a finite uh, n, finite number of particles precaution of the, of the full developed uh, phase transition. Um, you can interpret it. I, I won't go into detail, but you, the, you can interpret the, the emergence of this discontinuity as the emergence of what is called a bright soliton in the system. It's not so important. It's, let's go to the picture that we like so, so much. This is, uh, I'm showing you the spectrum now with uh, many, many, um, uh, many particles. It gets very, very dense. And this is, this. you see how the density of states, this is the code for the density of states as a function of the interaction parameter. Then you get this region where the density of states is anomalously large. So if you move in the direction, in the vertical direction, there is a point where you cross this, this line where the density of states is quite large. In, in, the, in the thermodynamic limit is diverging. And we know how it diverges. It diverges logarithmically. So um, I won't go into detail. This is extra material to convince you that the semi-classical approximation captures everything here. I mean, the, the way the minimal gap goes to zero with the number of particles is given by some exponent. We can calculate semi-classically. Um, and the place where it happens as a function of the, the, the value of the critical parameter also changes a little bit with the number of particles. This is also characterized by a parameter that you can obtain as well and uh, compare with, with uh, numerics and it works very well. So this is advertisement for the quality of the semi-classical quantization we are doing here. Now, we want to go very, very near of these uh, separatrix. We want to study the quantization, or we want to quantize, to use the semi-classical quantization to study the spectrum very close to the separatrix. This means that I, if this is the red line in the separatrix here, I have to consider um, the dynamics very near inside the separatrix and very near outside the, the separatrix. And as you can imagine, around here, you will have fixed points, subtle uh, hyperbolic fixed points of the, of the dynamics, as you expect, because you have an exact state quantum phase transition. You have subtle points around in the classical phase space. Now, this is, uh, this is a hard problem. Uh, you have to, to work a little bit to, to get it right. And uh, a result that was known already from the first papers of Pavel in the, in the exact state quantum phase transition is that somehow the, the, what happens around the separatrix can be modeled by an uh, inverted oscillator. Now, an inverted oscillator doesn't have a discrete spectrum. So you cannot just 
put instead of the separatrix an inverted oscillator. This makes no sense. But what you can do is to study locally, assuming that locally things look like a har inverted harmonic oscillator because it's unstable, and to, to find your way how to match this with the fact that the system is bounded uh, away from, from this uh, region. And one thing that, that, that was uh, known is that the action, the, this area that you need to quantize your energy levels uh, has a logarithmic dependence with the energy when you approach the, the separatrix. So this already you should start seeing, okay, this, I see the logarithmic divergence in the density of the states due to this logarithmic dependence of the action that I'm going to quantize. What I want to, then you can formulate this as an exact quantization rule. And one thing that, uh, that involves a Lambert function is a difficult problem, but something that is super important here is that the separation of energies near the separatrix has a logarithmic dependence with the number of particles. Now, remember that the number of particles is something like our Planck, inverse Planck constant. So this is a logarithmic dependence in the Planck constant. And this, has, this is very, very different from the typical separation in a, away from criticality, which is an algebraic function of the number of particles. This is only logarithmic in the number of particles near the separatrix. So um, if you plot the, the, the spectrum and look for this, uh, for this behavior, well, it, you see what, you, what we all know, that the density of states, which is this row here, um, gets a logarithmic singularity around the energy of the separatrix. And okay, because this logarithmic singularity that comes from this logarithmic dependence on the, on the, on the energy I showed you uh, before, uh, the characteristic time, which is something like uh, h bar divided by this level of spacing around the separatrix, gets a logarithmic dependence. Now, this equation, pay attention to this equation, looks a lot like the Ehrenfest time in chaotic systems. In chaotic systems, the Ehrenfest time is defined as logarithmic in h bar with one over the Lyapunov exponent. Now we have one over the exponent that characterizes the instability of the fixed point and is logarithmic in the number of particles. So this formally suggests that there is an Ehrenfest, kind of local Ehrenfest time around uh, separatrices and around um, criticality. And therefore I'm expecting to, to see a scrambling around. And I expected to see a breakdown of the classical quantum correspondence in a time which is logarithmic instead of algebraic with the number of particles, meaning a short time. The nearest separatrix, the quantum classical correspondence breaks down fast. That's the meaning of fast scrambling also. Okay, the idea that this may happen and can be made precise is explored in, the, in, in, our, in this paper. Okay, now my claim is that there is a scrambling around uh, criticality. So let's check it out. To check it out numerically, what we did was to construct the one-body density matrix. Uh, this is something you can define with the expectation value of this object. This defines this one-body density matrix. It depends on time, and it has a time-dependent uh, von Neumann entropy. I can go and calculate numerically. And I'm formulating the question like that. What is the signature of a scrambling in the behavior of the von Neumann entropy? So what happens is that the von Neumann entropy, which is plotted here as a function of the time, I'm increasing time here. The von Neumann entropy is started with zero by, by, by construction because the way we define our initial state. And then it, it increases, increases, increases. And you see that if I fix a threshold, this red line, the time it takes for the von Neumann entropy to reach that threshold is larger and larger depending on the number of particles. And then I can plot, I can calculate, I can check what is the time it takes to reach certain, this threshold is arbitrary, you can put whatever you want there. And then you will find out that the time it takes for the von Neumann entropy to grow up to certain threshold is given by a logarithmic time scale in the number of particles. So this is a scramble. The von Neumann entropy grows, um, the, 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 the time scale associated with the growth of the von Neumann uh, entropy is way, way shorter than the time scale. Usually uh, it takes the Neumann entropy to, to, uh, the Neumann entropy to grow, which is just is algebraic in the number of particles and no logarithmic. So this is fast scrambling in the von Neumann entropy. 
Uh, you can do it very, very precise, go and do heavy numerics, but the agreement is really perfect, exactly as we expect. Log of the number of particles divided by stability exponent of the fixed point of the SQPT. Well, so I show you before what happens here. So the Feynman entropy grows. But what happens, we ask this question, okay, let's plot it for larger times. And this, then come the surprise. Because it grows hmm, with a time scale tau, logarithmic in the number of particles. But we were very surprised at the beginning to see that this displays revivals and very strong revivals. This is not an, an artifact. And not, these are not, um, these are not recurrences, you know? Recurrences in the sense of the um, revivals in the time, in the quantum evolution because unitarity, meaning because of the discreteness of the spectrum. Uh, these are astronomically, they occur in a, in a scale which is astronomically large compared with what we are seeing here. So there, this is, these are no recurrences. So what are these guys doing, doing here? Good question. So let's check it out whether this is not only kind of a special thing of the von Neumann entropy. Let's check out the OTOC. So this is the out of time of the correlator for different values of the number of particles. The inset shows the behavior for short times showing the expected exponential behavior for short times, fast scrambling because of criticality. But then you have these very, very pronounced uh, uh, revivals that get more and more pronounced the larger the number of particles as, as with the entropy. These revivals are more and more pronounced depending on the number of particles, if you increase the number of particles. So they are, uh, we have in the auto the coexistence of uh, initial fast scrambling and revivals. And with the, with, the, with the logarithmic scale, these are not uh, recurrence. So let's, let, we have to come back to the spectrum to understand what's going on here. This I showed you before is what we know. It's the logarithmic divergence of the, of the spectral density near the separatrix. But what happens now that came as a surprise is that I'm plotting the spectrum again as a function of the quantum number. And what you see here is that you see the logarithmic singularity but the larger the number of particles, the more uh, homogeneous the spectrum is. And of course, I mean, you can tell me, hey, what are you doing with 10 to the 42 particles? That's crazy. Well, there is a good reason for that. The, this kind of number you see when this model, the Liebling model truncated to three, three, three modes, has been proposed as a, as a model for a condensate of uh, gravitons describing if you believe that a uh, black hole can be a condensate of gravitons, then this model describes the critical behavior of that system. And this uh, is a, a serious proposal. So these kind of numbers appear there. But of course, already at this level, you see this tendency of the spectrum to get equidistant. And- um, Juan, Juan Diego, you have uh, five, five more minutes. Uh, yes. Sorry for to interrupt you, but- No, no I, just... five minutes is perfect. I'm, I'm done perfect. with that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So even if you have a divergence in the mean level density, that is very counterintuitive. For, for me, at least it was difficult to, to, to grasp. You have a region where the levels, um, where the number of levels per unit of energy divergence, but it's still, and this you have to, to you, you need the discrete spectrum to understand what, I, what I'm saying. You need to go and study the discrete spectrum. Still, uh, the discrete energy levels in certain uh, window around this divergence get homogeneously distributed, almost constant, although you have a divergence there. It's quite, quite a special thing. And because of that, of course, if you have a homogeneous spectrum, you must have revivals. That's that explanation of the revivals because the discrete spectrum gets homogeneous. Now, you can ask whether this is a robust feature. It can be that uh, this is the moment that you mm, put a little perturbation that goes away. Well, no. Pretty much as uh, uh, you can, mm, you can find regimes in non integral systems where the stationary with the um, SQPT survive a perturbation. Uh, these revivals also survive perturbations. What I'm doing here is going from the three side model, which is integral, to the five side model, which is not integral. And there you will still see the, 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 the revivals there. This is what I'm doing here. This is three sides, this is five sides. 
And uh, if you do the autoc, again, this is three sites and this is five sites. So you still see the revival. This is kind of robust uh, effect. Great. So I'm done. Let me summarize. In the first part of the of the talk, I told you about uh, semi-classics in phase space, uh, semi-classics in many-body space, semi-classics in general. And uh, I want you to take home the, the following message about that. The semi-classical methods in the sense of Gusbitter account for interfering phenomena, discreteness, um, coherent backscattering, uh, superposition, all these things are accounted for using semi-classics. And uh, please remember that. And uh, semi-classics is not simply classical mechanics. Now, the ideas of semi-classical methods can be lifted to focus space to describe many body systems of uh, identical particles, bosons or fermions. And they, they account for the fast scrambling and the saturation due to interference of uh, the autox for chaotic systems. Now, the thing is the SQPTs require quasi-integrability or integrability. So what we have done is to find a SQPT in a, in a particular model we extend the, the, the techniques of semi-classics on semi-classical quantization into focus space and study the discrete spectrum near separatrices. And what we found is that the, there is fast scrambling, initial fast scrambling due to local instability, uh, but there is no saturation, but revivals later that are not recurrent. They have a time scale that is very, very, very low compared with the, with the recurrences. It's only logarithmic. And um, this unique time scale, this local phase time, rules everything. It rules the initial exponential increase, the revivals, and the breaking of uh, the quantum classical correspondence. Everything is described by the same time scale. OK, I want to leave you with the the figure and the paper. And thanks a lot for your attention. Sorry for taking too long. OK, thank you very much. OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> no noise. My kid doesn't like flow. He doesn't uh -huh. like semi-classics. <laughs> well, he prefers dinosaurs, that's more, more classic. <laughs> so I saw a hand first, Pe Pedro, Pe Pedro Perez Fernandez, I saw his hand. Then there is another one. So Pedro, you're first. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> ah, it was, it was not a hand. Okay, I, I thought that you were going to ask uh, something. So is there somebody, has somebody any question, comment regarding the, the presentation? May, may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, are, are these uh, revivals something to do with quantum stars? Uh, great question. Um, so there is this, uh, this um, if, you, if you let me use the, uh, let's say the conservative definition of scars as we give in the quantum chaos community, meaning uh, enhancement around unstable uh, periodic orbits in chaotic systems, then the other is no, because this system is not chaotic. Uh, you don't have unstable periodic orbits uh, uh, there. So now I, we do think that there is something, uh, a phenomena related with excited state quantum phase transitions happening around periodic orbits. We are studying this now. And if this is the case, maybe eventually we can make that connection. At the moment, these revivals are really specific of the, of the spectrum around the separatrix to be equidistant. I would love to have a semi-classical picture in terms of the scars, as, as, you, as you suggest. This, uh, this we don't have at the moment. Now, if you let me think about uh, scars as the many body quantum chaos community like to think scars, which is not necessarily related with um, uh, unstable periodic orbits, with, but with other sort of localization phenomena uh, in, uh, in focus space, then maybe, maybe this is some sort of localization what's going on in the, there. But I cannot tell you for sure. It's a very good question. I don't have a, I don't have a, it's a hard question. I don't have an answer. Thank you. Somehow the, somehow the, in the second picture is what you say, if there is the integrability emerging. Uh, yeah, yeah. Somehow it's yeah. just this. Yes, yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Uh, Jorge, I think, has a, has a question. Okay, just a very, very nice talk, Juan Diego. Thank Many you. Thanks. It was a, a very complicated math, but you really guided us through Sorry this. about that. <laughs> no, no, but I understand this is your, your work. But I, I just wanted to mention that uh, this model is very close to the Lipkin model. But it, sure. Perhaps, uh, and, sure. And this point, you, you perhaps it is worth to mention that the at, at this uh, excited state quantum phase transition, the classical Lyapunov exponent is positive. So this is, I think this is relevant because you are connecting. So it is obviously the autoc grows exponentially at this point, even this, if the system is integrable. Also, it is closely associated with the fact that the classical Lyapunov exponent is positive only in this orbit. Yeah, I, I have an, a little bit of issue of uh, terminology there uh, because I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to call um, the, the stability exponent of a single uh, trajectory the, the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, kind of the, usually, at least in, in, in very conservative way of thinking of of, of the, the, the quantum chaos community, um, the, mm, the difference kind of between a Lyapunov exponent and an instability exponent is that the Lyapunov exponent is kind of, mm, is kind of phase space property. You shouldn't put it at a, a, at a unique point, let's say. But I completely agree. They play exactly the same role. What I call instability exponent is your Lyapunov exponent of the separatrix. No, that's it's exactly that. And I I would love to see uh, someone uh, getting these oscillations also in. We know that the Josephson Hamiltonian is everything. Is that is the is the bose howard model with two sides? Is the LMG model? It's uh, some some limit of the uh, the other one that you like that much. Uh, sorry. Um, Mm, no, Ravi, what is the other? The, 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 the DK. The DK. So this thing has to be in all these places. This, this must happen. It's just that, I mean, we did it with this one, and the, to, to reach such number of particles numerically, you better have a system when you know, you trust, and you know what you are doing. But I think this is a, my claim is that this is a generic phenomenon, certainly. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I have I have also a question. This that you're showing this this autoc, this CT. This is a micro canonical autoc, isn't it? This is the autoc for 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 an again value of the of the system, again state of the system. Uh, almost. Or, it's a, it's the it's a good question. Is the is the autoc for um for um, for the non-interacting state, which is really really close to the interacting ground state, kind of. So. It's not an eigenstate because the mm -hmm. auto for an eigenstate is kind of um, it's, it's it's not very no, doesn't it it does it doesn't happen that much. You can think about this as a as a quench. So I have the non-interacting system. I have an eigenstate, the ground state of the non-interacting system, and I quench two interactions. And then okay. this is not an eigenstate of the interacting system at all, but actually uh -huh. it's, it's close. It's close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but then when you quench it. The, the the it comes at an as a, at an energy close to the critical energy for the ESPT yes. or everything yes. I'm doing I have to go right there man the, okay I, if okay. I try to do this uh, thermal the phase space of the system doesn't let you go for example thermal because the the volume of phase space where you feel the SQPT is too small now there is a work by um, this guy. In, uh, is Scadifi, I think is the name. I, I will give you the reference where they have a phase space where you have one hyperbolic fixed point right in the middle with a huge basin uh, around. And in this system, for example, if you do the thermal autoc, you see the, the um, uh, you see some of this uh, structure. You see the exponential increasing, although the mm. system is not fully chaotic. I will give you this. It's, it's a PRL. Uh, a couple of okay. years ago, that, that, but uh, to catch these things in complicated phase spaces or not not too simple phase spaces, absolutely you need to go right there, man. You otherwise okay. you don't get it. Like with many body scars, what people okay. call many body scars, 
Uh, this is a standard question. Hey, but uh, is this kind of generic? I can see it in a thermal state. No, you have to go mm -hmm. right there to, to, to see them. So yeah, yeah, because we, we we've been interested uh, recently, like like uh, Lea and, and Jorge Hirsch on 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 the fact that this exponential increase of the auto happens even for for non chaotic system when, when whenever you are close to a critical. Sure. critical point and and that i think that that's a very interesting and sure. and uh, also i think you have you've done a very nice introduction of this complex complex subject of of uh, semi classical uh, approximations and thank it, you especially for for people that we are far from from this field that that uh, that has clarified much of the terminology thank you and, thank you i'm and, happy to hear that and I think, I, I, well, in fact, I, I, I guess that, it, that, that that's uh, the point that, that it's very complex, but that makes uh, that you, you can go to very high number of particles, even though that, 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 like making the exact numerical quantum calculation will be impossible due to the number of particles. I guess yeah. that, that that's the, that's the, the point. Sure, of, sure. of this and I, and I was also surprised when I saw this 10 to the 40 something <laughs> okay, okay, black they, hole. <laughs> how many protons are there in the universe <laughs> we no, no, that's, 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 that's crazy <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's weird that, that's quite weird uh, that, uh, are there any any more questions or comments or remarks for our speaker and remember to all of you if there are people willing to Give a talk in May. We are looking for for candidates. So, or you know somebody that that uh, may have interesting results that can be related to SQPTs, and uh, we will be very happy to host them in in our talk uh, series. Uh, more questions for our speaker for Juan Diego. So okay, okay. So then we will close the today's session i will go back to the dinosaurs and and you go go back go back to your weekend have a very nice weekend everybody everywhere and and stay stay safe thank you very okay. much everyone for attending thanks bye francisco bye. thanks everyone i see okay. you next time <laughs>